Back in the year 2000, God moved Mary Jo, myself, and our family here to Jacksonville, Florida. We thought it was so that I could take a job working for a law firm in that building that's right behind us. But from that vantage point on the 15th floor, God began to stir and birth something in my heart. From there, I could see the city, its waterways, its bridges, its businesses, and its people. And God began to implant just a heart inside of me that we would see our city transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. That birthing would ultimately result in Journey Church coming to fruition right from this very place in the heart of this city. but we're also a church that's dead serious about sharing the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? Let's go ahead and pray and we'll get into God's word today. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We thank you for these past 10 years. You have been so gracious to us. You have allowed us to see so many lives changed, so many marriages restored, so many outreaches done, seen kids and families impacted all over the globe as a result of the people of Journey Church and their generosity and their service. Father, we look forward to the days ahead and what you would have for us. And Father, we just ask you that today as we dive into your word, as we share and recast the vision for the future of Journey Church, would you use this as a moment, much like the first day when we gathered together, to maybe knit some hearts to Journey for the very first time, or for others to reiterate why they're a part of this great church. Lord, we ask you to empower us by your Holy Spirit for the years that are ahead. Um, Lord, may they be prosperous. Lord, we know that the best days are yet to come. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Well, we thank you so much for being here today. I'm going to take this moment, much as I did some 10 years ago, um, when I went on this stage for the very first time on a Saturday night, to share with you a little bit of the heart of what we're hoping Journey Church will continue to be at this stage. Maybe some of the slight nuances of the differences that we foresee in the days ahead as we really just cast this vision with the hope that you'll say, yes, I want to be on board. Yes, I want to have deep roots. Yes, I want to be a part of what God is doing here in Jacksonville. So as you saw in that video, this dream really probably started around 2000. It took some time to begin to take fruit and take root in the lives of Mary Jo and I. And then um, we moved to Jacksonville in the year 2000. I started working for that law firm in the building that you saw there. I had that vantage point of the 15th floor. And really moving to Jacksonville from Miami was culture shock. I don't know if it was culture shock when you first moved here, but it was culture shock for Mary Jo and I when we first moved here. And if I were honest with you for about the first six months, I wanted to go home. I wanted to go back there. I needed auto con pollo. I needed maduros. I needed Cuban food. And we didn't have any here at that time. Come on, Jesus, for Cuban food. Um, you know, we, I, I, there were parts of the culture that I missed. In fact, we moved to an area of Jacksonville uh, called Eagle Harbor in Fleming Island. And when we moved to Eagle Harbor in the year 2000, it was 99.99999% white people. So I got here and I was like, there's far too many white people here. I mean, like, what is this? I grew up in such a culturally diverse place that it was a little bit of shocking to us, but we, cer we certainly began to fall in love with this city, but it took a little bit of time. I remember maybe those first six months, some of our prayers were rather selfish in nature, like, please, Lord, can we go back to Miami? Please, Lord. I had a boss at the time who was, a, it seemed like an evil dictator when I first moved here. Um, thank she just now retired. We went to her uh, retirement party not long ago, and she ended up becoming a very good friend. But that transition, like for some of you might be here, maybe the Navy just moved you here. Maybe a job uh, just moved you here. It might be a difficult season for you. Hang in there. Jacksonville has a way of growing on you. I assure you, you will soon fall in love with it. I don't recall the exact day, but before I knew it, I, I began praying for the city. I would arrive there and I would go up to my office and I would look out over that window and God began to put something on my heart for this city and its people. And I could see the pain that some were having. I could hear the stories about what was going on in people's lives. And somewhere deep down, I began to pray for the welfare of the city. I began to pray for an outpouring of salvation. I began to pray for revival in this city, for spiritual renewal to take place. 
I actually sensed maybe a call to ministry when we were still in South Florida, but it had yet to be realized. I was going about my life as an IT person, and I loved it, and I thought that that's what life really consisted of. But God began to have new plans and new stirrings in my heart. And some three years into our time here, those thoughts would begin to start to become a reality. And uh, God would have us open up a small group in our home that would quickly grow and then ultimately would become what we call today Journey Church. Can I pause right now and say that none of this would have been possible, none of this would have happened at all if it were not for my lovely, wonderful, believing, awesome wife, Mary Jo. We love you, baby. She's been there from day one, Um, you know. I would give her 90 plus percent of the credit, especially just for putting up with me for all these years. And uh, the decor, the kids, she's done so many roles here at Journey Church and she did all of them with excellence and she demonstrates her love and everything that she does, every balloon she blows up. She blew up all these by herself. I mean, no, I'm teasing. I'm just a great team. Uh, but uh, thank you, Mary Jo. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. None of this would have been possible without her. Give her one more round of applause. I dare not name names because um, I will definitely forget forget some, but there are many people who were here during first service and today who were part of this fellowship from the early days. Thank you for believing in us when we, you know, when we were just getting started. Thank you for hearing that vision and joining us in that and saying, hey, we want to be a part of what God's doing. I've noticed something in this journey that God has some people here for a short time. He has other people here for a long time. Um, He has everyone here for the right time, for that right season. God knows what he's doing. And we thank God for every one of you, whether you were here from the very beginning, from day one, which there are people here in this room that were here from day one, or this is your first day walking through Journey Church. We are so grateful that you are here today to be a part of what God is doing as we are celebrating that today and as we're beginning to look forward to what he wants to do. So when I first gathered here, we first gathered here, there might have been a hundred and something people that came out that Saturday night, and we cast this vision. We used the words, love God, love others, and serve the world. That's what we're going to do. We're going to love God. We're going to love others. We're going to serve the world. Our language might have changed slightly, but the meaning behind those three principles is really still the same, and it's part of the vision that we'll recast today. Uh, people gathered from all over the city at that point and they said, hey, we, we want to be a part of what God's doing. And, and we got to enjoy the beautiful fruit of that. You got to see some of those pictures. We'll post them online as well. But we've literally seen hundreds upon hundreds of people get saved here over the years. Hundreds of hundreds upon people get baptized here. We've seen marriages restored. We've seen people come out of the throes of addiction. We've seen people trapped in poverty come out and lead successful lives. We've seen amazing miracles of God happen right here in this very room, would you give him just a little bit of glory? God's even given us glimpses of what it might be like to reach people globally through partnerships like Acts 29 and Compassion International. We'll explore that a little bit more um, before the conclusion of the service today. But in so many ways, at 10 years old, I feel a little nervous. How many of you remember what it was like when you were about 10 or 11 years old? You were getting ready to leave elementary school and you're getting ready to go into junior high. I don't know about you, but I was petrified. I was a little nerdy kid. I was Mr. Magoo at that time. I mean, that was what, what I was. And it was just a petrifying time. I could remember being on that bus for that first time, getting ready to go to junior high. Was anybody else nervous or was it just me? Some, all you cool kids, come on, Jesus. Like, no, I'm still cool. I got it together. I, I, I wasn't nervous. But then in some ways, that's how I feel that we're at. You know, maybe we can avoid some of the dumb mistakes that we made when we were in elementary school. As we get ready to move on to the next season of the life of journey, we've learned a little bit more. We have become a little bit mature, more mature in some areas, a little bit more fun in other areas. But God is in control, and I couldn't be more excited about what lies ahead for us in the days ahead. I pray that we would be bold enough to continue on with this crazy vision that God has given us. So today, as we celebrate 10 years in ministry, I don't want to take my future with you for granted. We don't want to take your participation 
in this vision for granted. We want to um, hopefully see you knit together with what God is doing here and say, yes, I want deep roots. Yes, I want to be all in. Yes, I want to see my city transformed. See, every empty seat that remains in this building today is a soul that still needs to be one for Jesus. God's entrusted us with this wonderful facility. He's given us a lot of great people like you who are sitting in these chairs, but there's a lot of hurting people outside these walls who so desperately need him. Would we go for it with everything that is within us to see them come to know him as their Lord and Savior? Can I get an amen to that as well? So please consider laying down deep roots. I'm here to tell you today that this is fertile soil. I know that we can bear much fruit in the next 10 years and yield a harvest beyond anything that we could ever imagine, but it's going to take people like yourselves to sacrificially give, sacrificially serve, sacrificially live on mission if we want to see this vision realized. So in a nutshell, what is our vision? What is our hope here at Journey Church? Our hope, if you've been around any length of time, hopefully you know this statement, is to see the city of Jacksonville transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. And there's a lot in there. There's a lot in the midst of those words that we want to see become a reality. Our hope is for this city. We want to see it changed. We want to see it transformed. So much has changed since the first time that we gathered together here in this room some 10 years ago. I remember the Orange Park Mall was a completely different place. Kids were not rioting on Saturday nights at the Orange Park Mall 10 years ago. But they are today, right? The next generation needs us more than ever before. And God's uniquely positioned us a mile away from that mall so that we could see those young people come to know Jesus if we're bold enough to go out there and go after them in the name of Jesus. I believe he's brought you here for such a time as this. Our city needs transformation. People are hurting. People are dying. People are, you know, losing their minds here in our great city. Think about just the, the topic of addiction that we've shared a few times recently. Do you know that the morgue in Jacksonville is o so over flooded that they can't take new people because people are dying from heroin every single day? We can make a difference in that. We can transform people by the power of the gospel for the glory of God. We can reach out to people who are far from God. I'm sick and tired of doing funerals for people who die from heroin overdoses. We were watching and doing what we do to enjoy ourselves just the other night, Mary Jo and I took the kids and we went to see Wonder Woman. It was a cool movie. Didn't anybody get to see it? Wonder Woman, any fans? Had a good time? If you didn't, great movie. Go out and check it out. But we're sitting there getting ready to go watch the movie and I get a text from a friend who actually lives here in the city. And they told me of a friend that I went to high school with that died from a heroin overdose just this, this past Saturday night. It's epidemic. These are opportunities for God to show his face in our midst. We have people all around us who so desperately need to know him from all different backgrounds. I'm believing that God will raise up a people like yourselves to reach them. You see, this church looks a little bit different than when we first got started. When we first got started, I thought our ministry was going to be the up and outers. I lived in Eagle Harbor and I thought I was going to be going after the doctors. I thought I was going to be going after the CPAs. I thought we were going to be going after the lawyers. And to a degree, we were able to reach some of them. But God's given us this beautiful, unique mix of people from all over the city with all different kinds of backgrounds. I believe he's done it on purpose. I believe he's done it for a reason. Other churches are going and trying to plant in all the cool places of the city. We're planting on the west side. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Right? We're going to reach people all over the city. But we're doing it from right here, just a block off of the highway. God is up to something, and I ask you to join me in seeing our city transform. See, I truly believe with all my heart, just as I did some 10 years ago, that the local church is the hope of the world. The local church is the hope of the world, inspired by the power of the Holy Spirit, bought by the blood of Jesus. It has the ability to change lives. And God wants us deeply planted and rooted in a local church. Some of you may be here visiting us because you're friends of the church. You helped start it. If you're deeply plugged into a local church, amen, go all in there and do everything you can to advance its mission. But if you're not, please consider joining us. Please consider plugging in. The mission is large and God may have called you here for such a time as this. See, the cause of the local church, the cause of the kingdom of God is worth giving our lives to. It's worth dying for. Jesus certainly did. Would we, as a humble act of worship, pick up our crosses daily and follow him? 
As we continue to break that statement down, the only thing that truly transforms is the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is what changes our lives. Your willpower is insufficient, right? How many of you times you tried to change yourself by your willpower? How did that work out, right? A few of us have that power. Very few of us have that in our lives. But the Holy Spirit can truly transform in this life and into eternity by the power of the gospel. At Journey Church, we live by Romans 1.16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. We must continue to preach it. We must continue to teach it. We must continue to live it out and share it with every breath that is within us. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about you. You are the gospel. You're the living embodiment of the Holy Spirit. You're the ones who are out there every day on the streets. You're the ones who are out there in the neighborhoods. You're the ones who God wants to use to transform our city. Are we going to continue to do our best to preach from the platform? Oh, yes. But just like last week and in the days ahead and what we're going to be studying throughout the course of the rest of the year, we want to empower you to be able to have those kinds of conversations in your everyday lives. See, salvation demands that we live our lives sold out for Jesus. Our city needs it. Would we please engage in it and take the responsibility on ourselves of continuing to fill this place up to overflowing for the glory of God? So we embrace the power of the gospel and its ability to transform. As a humble act of worship, we go out there and we live our lives in such a way that bring glory to God. We long for this transformation to occur in our generation. Our hope is to see the city of Jacksonville transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. We don't shirk the responsibility or give it to somebody else. We realize as a people that the only way our city is going to be redeemed is if we engage, if we live out the gospel. We know that the gospel is only as good as the next generation. That we have this responsibility that we cannot leave to others. That we need to go out there ourselves and tell people about the wondrous works of Jesus and what he's done in our lives. Another thing that we pray will be a distinctive A new statement that's pretty much a mouthful, but I'm going to read it to you and break it down. That we would be a diverse, multicultural, multi-generational equipping congregation with global influence. Real churchy words there. It's for us church leader kind of people that get into these kinds of words. For the rest of us, including myself, I don't know what that even says. Now, let me break it down. A diverse, multicultural, multi-generational equipping congregation helps us set our focus. We talk about being a diverse church, a people of all different backgrounds. What do I mean when I say multicultural? People of different races gathering together in the same place. People of different socioeconomic backgrounds gathering together in the same place, worshiping with one another. There's a lot of churches that talk about this kind of stuff. In society, they tell us about it all the time. You don't have to go to pretty much any employer that you go to. How many of you had to go to diversity training when you got there and you started to go to work? Anybody had to go through diversity training? Right, five, five, there we go. Hallelujah. So we don't say it about diversity for just some generic reason. I believe that God created us with great differences so that we could learn from one another and that we could grow from one another and that we could love on one another in this world where the devil is doing everything that he can to put nation against nation, a people against people. How awesome is it and what a testimony it is to God when people of all different backgrounds gather together in one place to worship together, to love God together, to learn from one another, to learn about the nuances of what it's like to be different and the challenges that we're faced with. You know, we all are faced with different things, but God uses these differences to help us grow with one another. You know, I don't know the things that young black men are dealing with, but I'm trying to learn about those. Brinson and I sit down and talk, and we go to lunch, and there's stuff like the Hebrew-Israelite movement and other things that the young African-American people are having to deal with right now that I have no clue of how to go enter the gospel into that particular situation. 
But we can learn from one another. We could grow with one another. We could help one another. And I believe that diversity is a sign of the kingdom of God at work in our midst. Would he continue to raise that up here at Journey Church as he already has been doing? Can I get an amen to that one? To accomplish these things I'm talking about is going to take a very unique and special anointing. Um, I don't know if you've noticed it, but, you know, rich people tend to gather together and hang around rich people. Say, black people tend to hang around black people. White people tend to hang around white people. Hispanic people tend to hang around everybody. Come on, Jesus. I'm being stereotypical. (laughs) I'm just joking. But there's this isolationism that tends to happen at times that I think God wants to break down. And, you know, one of the things that we're praying for is, you know, we've generally been a, a, you know, a people, we don't have a bunch of rich people here. Put it that way, I guess would be one of the ways of saying it. Um, If you are a person of means, we desperately need you here to help accomplish our vision. The single largest gift that we ever received in the 10 years of Journey Church was 55000 And we rejoiced over it. We were so excited. I mean, I was blown away when that came in. I about did backflips in Jesus' name. And then you get over there and you're hanging out with pastors that are over there by the beaches. Oh, I got three guys that gave me $3 million. Come on, Jesus. I'm like, what? Just give me one. Come on, Lord. Just do one time. Help me out. That'd be so cool. Um, I joke, but I ask you that maybe you are here today and God's brought you through these doors and you're a person of means, you're a business professional. You know, let's break down these barriers. Let's all hang out together. Let's all worship with one another. It's going to take something special and unique to reach the people of our city. If we want to go out there and transform 103rd Street, you think we're going to not, you're going to be able to do that without some people of means helping come alongside of us to help us do this? It's not going to happen. So if you are a person of means, I just want to ask you today, would you consider, please, joining us on this very unique God-given mission that he's placed in front of us? We need you to make it come to pass. I read verses like Acts 2.44, and I'm blown away by them. And all who believe were there together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. You know, we get glimpses of that. I mean, I think a street side prayer that was mentioned earlier by Brinson and You know, they go out there and what a different kind of life they see and they encounter as they're bold enough to go out there on the streets. Or the groups that go to Clara White Mission or go to Salvation Army. You know, we at times, like, I I feel guilty. We go clean out our closet and we give clothes. I mean, it's like we're giving our leftovers, so to speak. These people are embracing them like it's brand new, just off the shelf, so blown away and amazed by people's generosity. Lord, would you expand that kind of a spirit? I think those are some of the beautiful things that I've seen come to pass that were unexpected for me. Maybe I looked at it from this white Anglo-Saxon version living in Eagle Harbor when we started Journey Church, and I thought we're going to reach all of the up and outers. And man, God has opened my eyes to the beauty of the diversity of the kingdom of God. And man, do we have a wonderful opportunity before us. Man, do we have a wonderful opportunity before us. I said multi-generational. You know, that's pretty unique in church too. You know, churches tend to be older and dying or churches tend to be going after young people, but very few churches have a lot of people with gray hair and a lot of babies at the same time. (laughs) Think about it, right? At Journey Church, we have a lot of people with gray hair and a lot of people with babies at the same time. How amazing is that? And we need that. We need that kind of diversity generationally. I think it's something that we've lost in our generation, starting maybe even with mine or before that. You see, I never knew my dad. My dad wasn't there to teach me about the gospel. My dad wasn't there to show me how to live. My mom was a single mom, and she had to raise me on her own. So if you are a person with gray hair or no hair in this place, we desperately need you here. This church might not worship-wise meet your preferences But let me tell you, your presence is so vitally important in this place. The next generation that is a fatherless generation that has come behind you needs your wisdom, needs your understanding, needs your care, needs your guidance, needs your direction. I was standing in the back, and it was a beautiful thing. Um, um, John Priestmeyer was there with with one of our ushers, uh, a younger African-American black man and an old white dude with a beard. Come on, Jesus. And he turned to me and he said, I'm learning from the wisdom of what he has to say. And I was like, man, what an amazingly beautiful thing. Where do you see that? How beautiful is that? 
No matter what your background is, we have a unique opportunity that stands before us. And if you are an older person in this room, I beg of you to join us on this journey. Does that mean we're going to be forgetting about our kids or the next generation? By no means whatsoever. In fact, one of the reasons I need you to love me enough, even if it doesn't meet your preferences, is because i got to tell you that we got to make a distinct emphasis here at Journey Church of getting younger as well. So what do I mean by that? The, ne- the gospel's only as good as the next generation. Churches have a tendency over time as their pastors age to get older as well. So if we have all 40-year-old and 50-year-old people on stage, do you think we're going to attract a lot of 20-year-olds? No, right? I mean, it, it, does it sound logical to you? I listened to a podcast, and they said this even from a secular viewpoint, and I think there's gospel implications to it. So do you know that marketers actually go and do all of the advertising that they do, advertising towards 20-something regardless of the demographic that they're trying to reach? Why do you think they do that? No matter your age, you want to be young again, do we not? (laughs) Isn't it true? And in the world, they seek out plastic surgery. In the world, they seek out all these different ways in which they want to be young again. But in all of our hearts, there's something that resonates with us where the youngness of spirit, that, that, that breath of fresh air that they breathe into, into life around us, it's something that we all want to be around, right? So we need to, as a church, because right now we're desperately missing the 20-something generation. We have a lot of youth here. We have a lot of kids here. We're going to continue to do an amazing job through people like Brinson and Kevin and their teams to reach out to the junior high, to reach out to the high school, to reach out to the next generation of kids. We're not going to skimp on that one bit. But also, if you're 20-something here, we need you to step up and lead groups. We need you to step up and lead from stage. We need you to help lead us in worship. We need you to help show us the way. And in turn, we need to help disciple them. We need to be there for them. We need to grow them up. We need to show them what it means to be mature in the faith. Is all this making sense to you today? So I'm asking God to create like a pink unicorn here at church. But I believe he could do it in the name of Jesus Christ. He's already doing it in our midst. The final part of that statement talked about being an equipping church with global influence. So I mentioned the equipping stuff, one generation sowing into the lives of the next generation, one culture learning from another culture that we could help one another grow to be fully devoted followers of Jesus. What does it mean to have global influence? I think that's part of the next stage, part of the next iteration of who we are at Journey. We've gotten glimpses of it. You know, right now you're sponsoring kids in Rwanda and Guatemala and the Dominican Republic and Haiti and Brazil. We planted churches in Brazil. We have churches that we're partnering with in Israel. We're having somewhat of a global influence, but I believe in the next iteration over the next 10 years, God's going to expand that if we will allow him to do so. Let me bring it back to you personally. What does the next couple of years look like if you're here at Journey Church? Let me read you my life statement so that maybe it'll set the stage for it. My life verse right now for this season is found in Colossians 1.28. It says, Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all His energy that He powerfully works within me. So my job is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, to see people presented as mature in Christ. So what does that leave for you and I? I think in the same way I talked about when we first started the church, we used the word love God, love others, and serve the world. Love God, love others, and serve the world. Those three statements are really the essence of Christianity. We maybe reframed them slightly today than we did before. We use identity, worship, community, and mission. See, our identity is to be founded and grounded in our relationship with Jesus Christ. But the world wants to tell us differently. Is your worldview positioned and your identity founded and grounded in your relationship with Jesus Christ? Or do you find your identity in your work? If you lost your work, what would that mean to you? Is your identity founded and grounded in how your children perform? Is your identity founded and grounded maybe in past hurts? The way someone treated you, the way that the world was against you, have you adapted to a victim mentality and that's not where God wants you? 
Your identity is to be founded and grounded in the fact that you are a son or daughter of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, that you're a prince or princess, that he bought you by his very blood and he wants you to be part of his family. You're adopted members of the family of the living God. And because of what he's done for us, because he ransomed us, because he saved us, because he died a sinner's place in our place for our sins that we might have life, we are compelled to live a life of worship. Not just on Sunday mornings, that's certainly a beautiful expression of it. As we gather together and worship the King of Kings with other believers and we lift up His name and we worship God through our finances and we worship God through our song, but He wants us to live everyday lives of worship when we find ourselves in our workplace, when we find ourselves in our neighborhood, when we find ourselves in the gym, wherever we find ourselves, He wants it to be a humble act of worship as we live our lives before a lost and hurting world. That's how we're called to live. That's how we're called to worship Him. We're called to do so in community, to love one another and hang out with one another and grow together with one another, to work out our faults and our differences and our insecurities in the context of relationships with other believers who will hold us accountable for living for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We call those here at Journey Church small groups. We call you to get plugged in and be involved in it and to hang out with other people and grow together under maturity with others. And always, 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 these three things, identity, worship, and community, lead us to mission. To go beyond ourselves, to remember that this life is not about us, but this life is about pointing people towards the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We strive to fill these empty seats for the glory of God that he might get glory as people give their lives to him, as people's lives are saved and transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God in our generation. Would we be a people who are compelled to live on mission? I hope some of the things that I've shared with you have resonated with you. Maybe you're new to Journey Church and you've been contemplating whether this is the place where you should lay down roots. I pray that it is. Maybe you've been here for some time. Maybe God used these words to re-energize your heart and re-fire you up about this mission. I pray that is the case. And I ask you today, as I did some 10 years ago, would you please join me on this journey? I want to see our city transformed. I want to see these ideals that I've been sharing lived out in our everyday lives. And I certainly pray with all my heart that you would join me on that mission. Would you rise with me and bow your heads and close your eyes? I'm going to pray, and then we're going to go out in a fun, fun way. A couple of announcements before we go. If you want to take pictures after the service, we do have our picture booth set up. The team, the barbecue small group, has been so gracious as to set up uh, food for us all in the annex. So after this service, I would encourage you to grab your kids and go back in there and join us in the annex and eat some barbecue with us and hang out with us and celebrate with us a little bit about what all has God's been doing. Just share some stories and meet some new people. I'd love to honestly hang out with you on Friday night, so please go by there and get your tickets. If you're new to Journey, come on up and say hello after the service as well. It would be great to just get to meet you and your family. Thank you so much for coming here and being a part of today's service. Let's pray that we're going to sing a variant of Happy Birthday, and you're going to wish they never gave me that little flute thing that they gave me or whatever it was when you see the video. Lord Jesus, yes, we can gather together to have fun. Oh gosh, we thank you for moments like this where we could celebrate as a church family, where old friends walk back through the doors. Maybe some would even consider staying for the next season of who we are as a church, where new friends are walking through the doors that we're just getting to know that you're calling alongside for the next leg of the journey. We thank you for the lives that have been saved already as a result of what's happened in the midst of this church. Lord, may we never take it for granted. Each and every soul that surrenders their life to you, may we never forget it. May it always be first and foremost on our hearts and minds that we would be a people who live on mission, that our identity would be founded and grounded in our relationship with you, that we'd live a life of worship in community on mission. Lord, I've laid out some bold ideals for a church of global influence that is multicultural and multi-generational that focuses on equipping people for the work of the ministry. Lord, I pray that these ideals would become a reality, that our hope truly would be realized, that we would be a part of seeing our city transformed by the power of the gospel for the glory of God and our generation. Amen and amen.
fasten your seatbelts, and enjoy some amazing worship. Ladies and gentlemen, the journey, Bubblicious Fisheye Band. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for coming out and being a part of Journey. They got one more dance they're going to do after the dance. Go back there and enjoy some food with us. God bless you guys.
Amen. Give it up for these young people. Then they do a great job. Hope to see you in the annex. If you're a guest, we do this every weekend. It's just like this every weekend. God bless you guys. Celebrate Jesus this week. Thank you for being here.